Hello, everyone. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Marcia, I missed you Tuesday morning. I know. I had to go take my car to the shop. I'm sorry. Okay. I figured you had something. In the pouring rain. <laughs> Ugh. Nice. Yeah. Yep. Is our speaker here? He is not here. Hmm. But he will be. That's what I was going to ask you. Actually, I thought, uh, I thought uh, evening prayer ran over. And so I messaged him. And, oh, here he is. Yeah. Yeah, it always runs over. Oh, hush. Hi, Bob. It's muted. Yeah. Robert, you have to unmute yourself. There you are. Thank you. Thank there you. you. Hi, it's so good to be with hey. you. Okay. Okay, I lost you. Hey, John. Greetings. How are you, Mickey? Good. How are you? Great. Good service tonight. Thanks. I missed it. Hey, Marlon. Oh, there you go. Hey. You were there in spirit, Marilyn. Yes. <laughs> I had issues. <laughs> <laughs> they do happen. <laughs> Garrett, how are you doing? Doing very well, sir. How are you? You, you realize you got the moniker of, of Madame Merida. Do I, I do. I do. This is, this is uh, not I, quite the same my name but i thought you know what not worth it <laughs> what, what, what's the movie that robin williams started starred in uh, down down what was it down what this is doubtfire yeah me yeah, i miss yeah. doubtfire <laughs> hi rhonda and phil hey john john Jan, how oh you doing? hi phil i saw and, yes. rhonda. i didn't see you yes i was putting dinner in the oven Look i thought i saw you. our guest yeah, but Rhonda did all the stuff. I just put it in. <laughs> well, y'all dynamic duel. <laughs> Something like that. It's good. Well, I, I think we're going to, we'll go ahead and get started. And as people uh, come in, we'll let them in and we'll just go from there. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Bob, thank you so much for joining. I just want to tell you a little give do a little introduction. Uh, I know most most of us have, have probably seen or met uh, Bob Simpson, um, but there are some things you may not know. Uh, Bob is uh, our canon for music uh, at our historic Christ Church Cathedral in downtown Houston. He is lecturer uh, of church music at the Shepherd School of Music uh, for Rice University and perhaps uh, most notably uh, founder and artistic director of the Grammy award-winning Houston Chamber Choir. Uh, following his graduation with honors from Brown University and the School of Sacred Music uh, at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, Bob studied for two years at the uh, Hochschule für Musik in Cologne, Germany. Uh, his teachers have included organists uh, Barclay Wood, Robert Baker, uh, and conductors Abraham Kaplan, uh, Peter Newman, Eric Erickson, and others. Uh, Mr. Simpson serves, served as vice chair of the Standing uh, Commission on Church Music for the Episcopal Church uh, and on the editorial board of the African American hymnal, Lift Every Voice and Sing Too, which is one of my favorite hymnals, by the way. Uh, he is a former member of the board of directors of Chorus America, a national service organization addressing the needs of professional and volunteer choirs. And I'm going to tell a very short personal story that Bob will not remember, but I do, and you'll, you'll find out why. I met Bob uh, once about 28 years ago when I was a 15-year-old organ student. Um, my father and stepmother uh, brought me to, uh, I was, I was, it was called organ hopping. Um, and I was visiting here in Baytown, visiting them, and we were going to several churches. And I called up Christ Church Cathedral and said, hey, can I come play your organ? And my dad couldn't believe that uh, Christ Church, historic Christ Church Cathedral uh, would let some kid 
uh, from uh, uh, Southeast Texas off the street, go play their organ. And what I remember most about that meeting um, was the conversation Bob had with myself, my stepmom, and, and my dad. Again, I was about 14, 15 years old. As we were walking from the offices to the church, um, my, my dad said, I, I'm just astounded that you will let this, my son in this, you know, off the street to play this instrument in this church. And, and Bob said something to the effect of, uh, I, I have strong feelings about churches who don't keep their organ consoles open and who don't allow uh, young people to uh, practice and, and touch the and see and hear the instrument. How else are we going to grow organists? And that had a profound effect on me, so much so that um, from my time in college when I was organist at Second Baptist Church in Houston, uh, through now uh, at Trinity, I have always kept the console open um, and entertained uh, young piano students, young organ students, anyone who wanted a few minutes at the organ. That, that was something that really struck a chord with me and has remained with me. So it is my great privilege and pleasure to welcome Mr. Robert Simpson tonight. Well, Garrett, thank you. And thank you for remembering that conversation. <clears throat> that is, uh, that's really touching. Thank you. So everybody, it's great to be with you. I think this is a fantastic program. And I'm, I'm uh, standing or sitting before you now as someone who's very much, uh, whose career is very much on pause. Because as you know, um, singing is at this point considered to be uh, hazardous to your health. And so we're all kind of waiting to see how this is going to, how quickly this is going to evolve. Um, I, I'm interested to know a little bit about the, the way, that, Garrett, you have shaped the music during this period at uh, Trinity. So start there. Tell me a little bit about how you're still incorporating music into the service. So we, at Trinity, we have a live stream and there are five or uh, six of us, I think, Mickey. Uh, we have uh, two wonderful, wonderful uh, people on, on camera, one of whom is, is with us. Um, there she is, Eileen, and uh, then Mickey Rios' daughter is also on another camera, um, but, but Mickey's husband uh, plays guitar, and kind of, our, we have a very blended service right now with, with me on the organ and piano and uh, James Rios uh, on the guitar uh, for uh, some of our more modern uh, music, and um, every so often when we are able to, uh, we, we include a uh, virtual choir video we did this for uh, Pentecost. Uh, we did two pieces, I believe, for Pentecost, and then we did something for Trinity Sunday. Uh, and um, it's it, that's 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 kind of where we are. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's not, of course, as you know, that's not just at Trinity. That's everywhere. That's everywhere. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I forgot to ask Garrett, how long do we go? So um, oh no, absolutely. So. Um, we can, we can, let's see, what time is it now? We can speak uh, until about uh, 7, 730 or so, and then oh, if we okay. open up for questions, if we have any. Oh, well, I hope there'll be questions before then, but I just didn't want to get rolling and then find myself running out of time. Yeah, it, uh, so the, the, the question about music has been decided for us in the diocese by the bishop, <clears throat> and uh, in consultation, daily consultation, certainly at the beginning, with authorities down at the medical center, uh, he crafted a very wise directive <clears throat> that includes no congregational singing. Uh, singers that are to be used should be spaced at least 15 feet apart, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, those churches that have organ galleries, the singers are not permitted to be up there so that they would be singing or projecting perhaps over the congregation. Uh, and so, uh, and, and no congregational singing. Um, so we are uh, like you uh, having live stream services. We have a soloist who comes and uh, with our wonderful organist, Daryl Robinson, who is also the professor of organ at the University of Houston. Uh, we have our 11 o'clock service nor, uh, normally, there are five services on Sunday uh, at 8 and 9, 11, 1 o'clock, which is a Spanish-speaking service, and then 5 o'clock, the well, which is a contemplative Celtic service 
uh, called, called the well. Um, we're having, pr at this point, just the 11 o'clock and the uh, 1 o'clock and the 5 o'clock. Uh, and so for, for me, uh, not having a choir to, to direct, my responsibilities become very administrative and uh, try to facilitate things. But uh, it's quite, uh, it's, it was quite a, a, an, an incredible experience for, for both in the cathedral and also for the Houston Chamber Choir uh, because we had been invited to, uh, well, first of all, we, we had the great surprise of winning the Grammy in January for best choral performance. And then we had several more performances to be uh, looking forward to at that season. And then just now we were to be in New Zealand to be a part of uh, an international choral symposium. The 24 choirs from around the world were invited to come. And so we went from the high of being invited to this international festival, the Grammy, to the bottom just dropping out where not only were we not going to New Zealand, we were not singing any concerts, there is no choir for me to direct and I am feeling very, very uh, lost at this point, uh, hanging on to the hope that if we just wait this out, uh, we're going to be okay and we'll be able to resume probably my guess is not much before the first of the new year, but, but we can see about that. Um, and so in the meantime, choirs have been trying to figure out as much as possible about what's going on and why. Um, you may have already read about the studies that are being done to uh, help us find out why choirs and instrumentalists who are blowing air into the room seem to be considered super spreaders. Uh, how many of you already know about how that's kind of shaping up? Okay, so, 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 so just to kind of pave the way, uh, very early on in March, a group of 61 singers got together in Washington State and 61 of them sang, 56 of them became ill, and two of them actually passed away. And so that became a very dramatic signal that singing uh, could be uh, a particularly dangerous activity based on the fact that as you sing, you're expelling your air with greater energy. The, there, there are uh, two uh, modes of, of communication. One is called the droplet, which is the larger that we can actually see, um, uh, and it drops to the ground fairly, fairly quickly. It's heavier. And at first we thought that that was the communicator, droplets. And so uh, six feet of distance, wearing masks, all very, very important. But now studies are starting to indicate that perhaps the aerosol particles are also involved and they are very small and they don't dissipate. They can hang in the air for a period of time. They do not fall to the ground the way the droplets do. And there is a study being undertaken, several studies being undertaken, but one is at Rice University with the Houston Grand Opera and with uh, the Shepherd School of Music. Uh, and the symphony is also playing a part in this to try to find out exactly what the mechanism is and how far apart uh, one needs to be to be completely free of these contaminants. Uh, the, the data is still not in and so we're, we're not sure, but the best that we can guess right now is that singers need to be at least 15 feet apart. Social distancing, we normally talk about six feet, but uh, they, those aerosol particles could go as far as, as 15 or more feet. And so that's why the singer's distance is greater. And there is really no way for us to know uh, how, the, uh, how long the particles stay in the air. And consequently, ventilation is now becoming a major issue. Uh, in fact, I was just reading about a, a, a study that's being done in England, and they are doing it in a surgical, uh, a surgical operating room 
because they want to make sure that the air in the room is as pure as possible and that anything that they're detecting is actually coming from the person and not lingering in the room from something else. So they're really, really taking this very, very seriously. So here we have um, this, this uh, airborne issue, uh, singers trying to figure out how they can keep their sanity during this time. And that is why virtual choirs have become something that is a, a very, uh, I think, important lifeline at this point. And I'm so glad that you've had a chance to participate in, in that. There is a, a composer by the name of um, Eric Whitaker, who is very well known. And for a number of years, starting back in 2009, 2010, he started to do virtual choirs as a, a way of bringing his music and singers together from distant, from, from across the globe. Uh, he, he started with a choir, I think of a couple of hundred and the most recent piece that he's done, I think has had three or four, or maybe more thousand of people uh, uh, as a part of this organization and, and singing his music. So virtual choirs have been around, but no one really knew much about them until we got into this um, pandemic. And then out of desperation, all of us have been scurrying to try to figure out the technology. Garrett, did you do both the audio and the video yourself? Yes, we, so I recorded a, a, an accompaniment track, a uh, click track that I sent to the, each member of the choir. And they record, and I don't think I've, it, I'm, I'm glad that you asked about this because I haven't had a, really a chance to, to explain, to talk about this to our congregation. Um, so they recorded their uh, audio themselves, their audio and video themselves um, individually, and then emailed those videos back to me. I then separated the video and the audio um, and uh, uh, trimmed the videos um, and then, it's a process of, of extracting the audio, extracting the video, and then combining each individual video to create one master video with everyone singing. And it's quite a labor intensive process. I shared a, year, a couple years ago a video of, um, on our, with our group uh, of John Rutter talking about the importance of choir. And how uh, he says in this in this interview that, that you know, and we know we all know this. We here know this. Choir is not a frill. It's so important for community and for uh, relationship. Um, and uh, even uh, science now tells us health benefits. Um, and though the virtual choir videos um, do are in fact are a lifeline, as you call them, um, Bob. Uh, uh, you well know that, and as are as do uh, I have a choir member here right right now, Mar Marcia. Um, we know that it, it is not the same. Yeah, no, it's not the same. But there is a special, and and I take my hat off to you for being able to get this technology going. Uh, we uh, the cathedral choir has done a virtual choir, and we're in the midst of doing another one. But um, but the the process. If, if one of the great joys of singing in a choir is that sense of being surrounded by enthusiasm, by the love of each other and the love of the music and the passion for the experience and everything that just makes your heart beat, just strip all of that away and you've got the experience of making a virtual choir. <laughs> you just take all of the heart out of it and it's just left with you and this click track and your cell phone and your voice <laughs> that you're used to having, used to having meld into the sound of the people around you and it's just you. And I have had so many people in the choirs at the cathedral say, you know, I used to sing well, but I just sound awful now, what's happened? And, um, and I tell them that it's, it's not that you sound worse than you normally do. You're just not, we're, we're just built not to like our, our speaking voice and heaven help us, our singing voice. And we're never really put on the spot to have to sing as solo. And so it's just getting comfortable with the fact that that's how we sing and getting 
together then with the rest of the choir in this virtual setting, the voices blend. And thanks to the technology of people like Garrett who know how to blend all of those voices together, we do have the finished product where we can see each other on the screen and we can see ourselves in our own living rooms or wherever we made it. But still, there is that sense of connection that comes just because we're empathizing. We're, we're experiencing the community um, kind of like a, a memory of it, a very strong hint of it is still in our minds as we do this. And so it does serve a very, very useful purpose and some great music is being made. But there is, n there is nothing at this point from the technological standpoint if we were all to try to sing happy birthday together, we would not be able to stay together. There is that internet delay and each of us would stumble to the finish line at a different time. The, 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 the hope was that someone would be able to come up with a technology where Garrett or I could direct and you all could sing from your homes. And in fact, it would all come out to each other's speakers at the same time. But that that is not the case and it seems not to be an easy technological uh, trick to pull off. So what we have right now are the virtual choirs and have all of you seen virtual choirs? Do you know yeah. uh -huh. what they look mm -hmm. like? Yeah. They can be very um, elaborate. Um, again, Eric Whitaker has uh, te technological help uh, of the highest order and there are um, faces coming in and they're making continents and then bringing them together. And it's just, oh, it, it's just an amazing thing. Eric Whitaker, if you haven't had a chance to see one of his virtual choirs, um, check out Eric Whitaker. He, he is, is the person who, who kind of set the bar and still uh, by, by virtue of, of his being so famous is still attracting a great deal of attention. But there are choirs all over the country. So. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow. I'll share one of his videos tomorrow morning on our Facebook page for the uh, music in the morning video. Oh, great. great. Yeah. yeah, you'll you'll really be impressed. But uh, we have a member of the Cathedral Choir who is over from England on a two-year work pr project, and she sang um, with uh, a group <clears throat> of singers in England who put together a virtual evensong. Um, their choir's large and small all around the world now doing these and it's uh, I think it's a great experience so I'm, I'm glad you guys are are up doing that as well do you have one in mind another project in mind uh, I, I I do actually uh, uh, coming up uh, when when we would normally be uh, uh, celebrating or uh, we would have I think we would have already celebrated rally day I think but um, when uh, Reverend uh, Krigler is back on Tuesday, and so she and I will be talking about, about that, and then I bring it to the choir. And first and foremost, I ask the choir, hey, guys, do you want to do this? <laughs> and if the choir gives the thumbs up, then... <laughs> you will go far, my son. That's it. You've got to <laughs> get everybody on board first. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, so here we are with this situation. Um, we are, we being the artistic community, are really in a lot of trouble. You may have read already that the opera has let a certain number of people go. The Houston Ballet announced in today's paper that they have done the same thing. And um, there is uh, just no end in sight. The Shepherd School, where I teach, each uh, is going to be having many of its classes in tents outside um, in that big parking area outside the Shepherd School. So if you're taking your, you know, Italian class or your theory class, you're likely to be in a tent because again, the ventilation, keeping those particles, aerosol or, or droplets from condensing into a space is very, very important. And it, um, it's probably going to be healthier for people to try to be as, as in as large a room as possible or even outside. So they have tents coming up. And it's a crime because they have just put the finishing touches on this brand new opera house. 
and okay. I hope all of you will get a chance to to go see it at some point. It's um, do 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 any of you know the Sh the Shepherd School of Music at Rice? If you have you've been there, just where the parking lot used to be on the other side of the Shepherd School, there is now this gorgeous opera house, and uh, having the um, the opportunity to not only choose how the building is going to look, they also had the opportunity to decide how the building should sound. So a group of people went to Europe looking at various opera houses uh, and choosing the, the style, the design, the size of the building, but also the acoustics of the building. It's now possible for you to say, yes, I would like to have the acoustics of the chapel at Versailles and then you can come back to Rice University and build it across from the Shepherd School of Music. So that is, in fact, what they have. They chose, out of all of the things that they looked at, they wanted to have the acoustics of the chapel at Versailles. And so when we go there, that's what we'll be experiencing, those acoustics. Fabulous. It's amazing. It's amazing. So we're, 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 we're patient. Uh, we're waiting. Um, the... Uh, you know, the congregation at the cathedral, like at Trinity, is chomping at the bit, but there really is no way for us to uh, accelerate this process. And so um, we have uh, gone from, we had two, two Sundays, and you may have gone back as well, to in-person worship for a, a, a week or two, or you never did. You just, you just. No. We, we have, we have, um, um, our uh, past, and she shares this with, with our congregation, um, uh, our pastor uh, is, is immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. And so we, we take uh, extra precaution. Um, but what we did to, to, to sort of, um, to have that experience that in person, we, we decided we would try, uh, we called it parking lot prayer, evening prayer. We gathered uh, in our parking lot. Uh, um, I provided music, uh, one of our parishioners uh, signed uh, for our deaf community, and uh, it was a lovely evening. Everyone, we parked on one side of the campus, uh, everyone brought chairs, and, and, and we had um, um, uh, mandala, man mandalas, uh, people were able to, to, to color with chalk, and kids were able to, it was a wonderful experience, and then Houston experienced a sharp incline in cases. And that week, we decided to 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 err, to err on the side of caution, and and that we would put those on hold until those numbers began to come down. Yeah, yeah. Well, we experienced two services back uh, when it seemed at the middle of uh, June that things were perhaps going back to something more manageable. Uh, and so Barclay Thompson, the uh, Dean of the Cathedral had arranged for just the vestry to be the congregation for the first service. Um, and there are elaborate arrangements that were made for people to register for the service online so that there weren't going to be more people than the 25% of the church's capacity would show up. And we didn't want people to be disappointed and, and turned away. So people had to go online and register that they were going to come. And then when they came, their temperature was taken and there were the pews were roped off. Uh, provisions were made for say a mom and dad and three kids to sit together, but uh, would then be uh, folks who came separately would also be safely uh, spaced so that uh, various configurations needed to be considered beforehand. Uh, and it all seemed to go really well. The big question, not the big question, another big question um, that had been raised that uh, Barclay had been receiving a lot of comments from the parish that what they missed most was communion. And originally, when we went on to um, streaming services, we did morning prayer. But uh, communion was very important. So how in heck were we going to do communion? Of course, the bishop had outlawed the chalice uh, at, at, at all. Um, and that's very, very wise. So where, where would we... Um, come to the altar rail or, or how would we do this? And, and so 
it was decided that the, the wafer would be put in a little paper cup like the kind you get at McDonald's to put your ketchup in. Mm -hmm. And so a wafer would be placed in there in individual cups at the, at the door to the cathedral. There would be one way to get in through what we call the bell porch, which is the main entrance that you know you come in from uh, Texas. That's the only way you could get in. And the only way you could get out is to go out that side door. If you go out the side door and keep going, you go into the big fellowship hall, the Reynolds Hall. And so by the pulpit, there was a table where the, where the, the, the bread, the wafer, consecrated elements would be there. And people uh, at, so there would be the, the prayer of consecration and then immediately the post-communion prayer and the dismissal. And people then would get up from their pews and, and, and uh, when uh, directed by the usher, would get up from the pew and then pass by the table, pick up the, the container with the wafer, consume the wafer, deposit it in a pa waste paper basket by the door, and then continue out uh, of the church. So that it was, it, it, it took a little getting used to the fact that you went right from the prayer of consecration to the post communion prayer, but, uh, and then the dismissal. But it, it was the only way to make sure that people, we didn't want people coming up, getting, and then coming back. It just created more traffic patterns and more possibilities of people um, not, not being. Uh, you know, as safe as possible. So we did that with the vestry the first Sunday, and then uh, 120 members of the congregation the next. Everything went beautifully, except the following week, the numbers went in the wrong direction, and so we were closed back up. And we've got, gosh, I don't know, uh, probably, Mick, you know uh, how many ordinand uh, diaconate uh, deacons we've got waiting out there to be uh, made uh, deacons, uh, how many uh, uh, seminarians about to be made deacons, because the, de the, the deacon's ordination was canceled. There were going to be two services, one at, I think it was like 10, and then at one o'clock. And um, that was the Saturday of the week that things were closed down. So um, families probably had already started to gather and who knows what all, but uh, there are a bunch of folks who will finally get to be deacons on August 1st. And so that's gonna happen uh, at one o'clock. Uh, and we're you know, very glad that they're getting a chance to finally, finally, finally uh, feel as if their ministry has been moved to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> so. So that's where we are. Um, artists are really hurting, the, particularly, you know, well, we, we know uh, that everybody's hurting and, and, and lives are being affected in financial as well as um, health ways. Uh, and um, it, it, really, it really is a time for, yeah. time for incredible compassion, prayer, and um, patience. Um, and, um, I, I'm, I feel very fortunate that, uh, that, that at the cathedral, the staff has been maintained. Um, there are certainly people like those who, who used to the, be the nursery workers in our Sunday schools who, who, are not, who do not have work at this point. But we've been very fortunate uh, that no one has been furloughed. And, um, and lives haven't been disrupted in that way. We are extremely blessed at, at Trinity uh, to be experiencing the same. I am ex having just moved to Baytown uh, from the Golden Triangle. Um, uh, I'm very, very, I consider myself to be very blessed. Me too, me too, absolutely. So that's kind of where we are and what, and, and what uh, church music is doing at the moment. Uh, I, I have a, a Thursday Zoom meeting with ministers of music around the city, and it's quite interesting to see how other denominations and, and other parts of God's church uh, have approached this. Um, the Roman Catholic diocese was fairly quick to open up, uh, and there have 
and, and I and they have continued to worship in person. Um, the director of music at the Co Cathedral um, tells me that uh, that the uh, congregation is singing. Um, there are not as many people there, but still, um, a, a small congregation, a small attendance for that congregation is 300 people. So there's still uh, hundreds of people coming to the Co Cathedral. Singing in person? Uh, singing in person, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Catholic Church. Yeah, and so they have taken a different, okay. different tact. Um, there are uh, churches like uh, St. Paul's United Methodist Church downtown um, that uh, never anticipated, and St. Luke's United Methodist Church, a big Methodist church on Westheimer here in town, that never anticipated reopening. Um, their minister felt that the worship experience would be so different from uh, the worship experience under these circumstances would be so different from what they expected that it would actually be more disappointing than helpful. And so he decided that he was just going to make his peace and the congregation followed him uh, that until we can worship in a fashion that's more similar to what we're used to, we're just going to leave, leave it alone. Um, and there's everybody in between. There, there, I, I uh, uh, was tipped off in the early days, uh, we had the uh, um, quartet from the cathedral choir singing as an ensemble, and they were spaced. But um, I was tipped off by a couple of the people who teach voice at the University of Houston that the, the, the singing community was feeling uncomfortable, and they hoped that churches wouldn't ask singers to sing in groups until certain until we'd gotten past the crisis. And I took that very seriously. And so we have not had an ensemble at the cathedral since March. Uh, we have individual soloists uh, come one at a time wearing masks like everybody else in the service until it's time for them to sing and then they sing, but they're distanced from everybody else. Uh, other churches around Houston have had as many as 12 or 15 people singing in their choirs and, and have continued to do that. Uh, and and uh, there are, are those that, uh, as I say, have not dispensed with congregational singing. So there's quite a wide range of practices. And from what I can tell, no one has uh, had second thoughts. So there seem to be several approaches that are working for different congregations. I was surprised as, as I many of us were, uh, are those of us who, who are professional churchgoers, <laughs> uh, when I saw uh, that uh, First Baptist in Dallas, Texas, uh, held a service, uh, I forget, it was a patriotic service, Vice President uh, Pence attended, uh, but the whole of their choir, uh, something like 100 plus uh, 200 people, were up there singing. And then it was re, it, it was it came out uh, several weeks after that that um, several of those members had tested positive for COVID uh, a week or so prior to the event. Oh my and, God! And sang uh, as as well, and that was just it. It it is sometimes it can be frustrating at times because you know our our friends and our family and our our church friends and family say you know I I see this. Uh, why can't we do this? And well, this one, that's why. Um, and uh, he was, um, he, uh, I don't think that, that that was a wise decision. I have strong feelings about that. <laughs> I do too. I think many of us do. And it's just um, a shame that there are so many, uh, uh, there's there so many streams of feelings that um, seem to be playing themselves out. Um, in in um, um, wearing a mask or or social distancing or all of that. Well, I so, think anytime you get uh, 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 creative creative minds, uh, there are going to be very passionate feelings about okay. any number of things, <laughs> right? Yeah. Your music ministry is glad you have create have uh, <laughs> strong feelings about that, Garrett. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, I, I early on, I, I, you know, and, and this could take us into dangerous territory. So I'm just going to get this off my chest. But I, I remember seeing uh, a news report from uh, from a fellow, you know, in his 60s on the beaches in Florida, and he was being asked why he wasn't wearing a mask, and he says, "My God, stronger than any virus." And I thought, okay, we don't have a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, anyway. Thank you so much for sharing uh, today uh, the state of, of really church. I feel like we've this has been a, a state of the uh, <laughs> really yeah. uh, and has been very enlightening. I want to open it up for uh, questions if anyone has any questions. Uh, Bob? I just have not a question, a comment. I really thank you for this because so often we feel like we're in this alone mm. and you brought us together with actually the cathedral and the rest of the music community and helping us understand that it's not just us and there is hope. Absolutely. There yeah. is. And you know, there will be a time when this is, um, in the rear view mirror <laughs> and we'll be so happy for that. But uh, just I'm a little sorry. plug for the Houston Chamber Choir. If uh, you're looking for a chance to hear some choral music on Mondays at noon, uh, the Houston Chamber Choir has a podcast called With One Accord that we have been producing since early March. And you can just go to HoustonChamberChoir.org and you'll see a podcast link and you'll see every, every podcast we've made. Uh, right now, there are over 50 there. Um, and so that's a, that, that was because, and I was just thinking, Jan, about the, the fact that we do feel, feel so isolated. And certainly, remember the beginning when we were just, just desperate uh, to, to try to figure out how to cope with our isolation. This was a chance for us, though separated, to feel connected in the way that music can do that. Uh, and so we've been, we've been very, very happy with the way that that, that has been received. But there is still through music that sense of um, a common um, emotional response uh, that, that we certainly have when we're listening to a CD. There's not an orchestra or a choir or a singer in front of us, but we're being transported by that music nonetheless. And so even in this time of, of distancing through virtual choirs and through recordings and gosh, everybody uh, from the Berlin Philharmonic through the Metropolitan Opera is providing us with free opportunities to see performances uh, live stream. So that music is still playing what I consider to be uh, one of the fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental um, uh, ties that that bind us uh, is is that feeling that we come to experience when we listen to great music and and so that is still available to us and I'm very grateful for that those podcasts by the way um, uh, friends are outstanding and if, if you if you aren't if you if that is is it if that is a techno technologically speaking out of your reach uh, and you do YouTube, you can find several uh, professional videos of the chamber choir uh, there. And, uh, uh, but I, I, if you are able to, to subscribe to their podcast, you would, you will not regret it. Well, Garrett, certainly, certainly uh, published by, by email. And if anyone is trying to get on, and I remember having some conversations with people early on, it's, again, like Zoom, you know, I, I joke and I say, I didn't even know how to spell it back in November. Uh, and here I, here I am doing it. Um, so it's just like that with podcasts too. So if, if you get stumped, please let me know and we'll make sure that you, you have a chance to listen in. It's not that hard, but like everything else, doing it the first time can be a little tricky. Do you have time for one more question? Of course. So my question is that is, um, <laughs> is virtually, do you lose out, you personally, I know when I play for an audience or sing for an audience or something, half of that for me is, uh, I'm gonna say energy exchange and that's not really what I mean. I Like that feeling of being able to give the audience what the composer demands or what the music demands and um, 
feeling them respond. And I know I've tried playing online and it's just not the same because I don't feel that. Do you find that same thing and how do you respond to that? Well, it's absolutely universal, Amy, and uh, it's one of the things that makes recording so difficult. Um, When you're in a recording studio or in a setting where you've got to make this great music, but there's no no response coming back from the audience, it can get very stilted. Um, And uh, I, I, you know, completely in another range, I thought it was very interesting to see how each of the late night hosts um, Stephen Colbert, for example, tried to do his program once or twice from the studio when it was being allowed without an audience. And it was just awful for, just to watch him try to deliver his punchlines with silence. And so now they've all gone to their homes and it's much more natural. But maybe it's that very same thing, uh, trying, to, trying to bounce off the, the emotional response of our music within uh, an audience performer situation is, yeah, there's nothing like it. And, and we'll get it back, but right now we have to make do. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yeah. I am, I was, uh, when I read your biography, I, and I, I don't believe that I knew this actually, uh, but I read that you, uh, one of your teachers was Abraham Kaplan. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, many of us probably, there are some here who probably aren't familiar with that name or his works. Um, but he happens to be one of my favorite composers and conductors. Um, his he has a um, his album Glorious. Are we talking about the same? I don't know if we are. I don't know if we are. Abe Kaplan was at Juilliard, and then he went out to the University of Washington. Yeah, yeah. So is that is that? Yeah, that's the same one. Okay, okay. Then I don't know about this. This. Uh, tell me about it. Uh, he had, well, what I really was going to talk about was he has a setting of uh, the, the 23rd Psalm. Oh. That is just exquisite. Just the most haunting setting of that text I have ever heard. And you know, if you are a, a church musician or listen to sacred music at all, um, then you've probably heard most, if not every possible incarnation of that text. And his um, uses as accompaniment, um, I think a flute, a vibraphone, uh, and uh, one other orf instrument with uh, soloist and chorus. And it, it just, the most exquisite setting. So I, want, I really wanted to ask you about your time studying with uh, Abraham Kaplan. Well, thank you, thank you. And I will look that up, I don't know about that. Um, so uh, Abe was uh, handpicked by Leonard Bernstein to come from Israel to New York in the 60s to be uh, kind of his, to be Bernstein's right hand person uh, to build a, a chorus for the New York Philharmonic. And while he was doing that, he was also teaching at Juilliard and, and the Union Theological Seminary School of Sacred Music, where I went. Uh, he was uh, matinee idol, good looks, um, and he kind of knew it. And <laughs> so <laughs> there was, there was um, uh, a, uh, a, so an aura that surrounded him. Um, and I, I really, he had a beautiful technique um, and I learned an awful lot about um, how to make gestures symbolize what, what I wanted musically. But he was not really interested in getting very close to students. He had other, th- other agendas uh, and higher, higher uh, goals than, than getting friendly with the students. So we never got very close, as a matter of fact, but um, great, great talent. And then surprise of all, uh, he, he decided that New York wasn't where he wanted to be and went out to, um, to uh, Seattle, uh, to the University of Washington, which at the time, well, of course, I grew up in Northern New Jersey, so I can say this with love. New Yorkers and New Jersey and those people, they can be really um, snobby. <laughs> <laughs> no. And why anyone would want to leave New York and go to uh, Seattle, of all places, just, 
I mean, the musical elite of New York, I, I was still just a little baby running around. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody, but I, even I got the vibes that this was considered to be, uh, you know, just quite, quite unexpected. Uh, but he had a brilliant career out there. And obviously, as a composer, I need to take a look at that Psalm 23. So that, so it was kind of a, a, a glancing blow, unfortunately, with, with Abe. I, I got to see what he did in the classroom, but there was, there was no chemistry beyond that, I'm afraid. I, uh, I had a, an experience with, um, I spent uh, a couple of months in uh, Southern California uh, studying hymn playing with uh, Fred Swan when he was still at the Crystal Cathedral, uh, which is now Christ Cathedral. Yes. who, by the way, as a side note, has unfortunately had to furlough their entire music staff, save their organist and one cantor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so that was, that was quite, and, and that's how I actually became, uh, how I was introduced to that music and to Kaplan was through Fred. So. Okay. Well, I will piggyback on that because we have just gone from one kind of person to the uh, warmest, friendliest, greatest guy, uh, Fred Swan, was when I was at Union, it's right across the street from Riverside Church. And so he was at Riverside Church at that point. And um, uh, very, very welcoming. Of course, everybody wanted to play the organ. And <laughs> that really, that really was a tricky, tricky thing for him to try to steer. There was a beautiful chapel organ, and so we all got to use the chapel organ, but there were so many things happening in the church that we couldn't get to the church organ. But Fred is, is one of the great people of this world, for sure. Very much so. so glad you got to know him. As am I, as am I. You know, I grew up watching uh, him play on the Hour of Power, and it was uh, more so to hear him play the hymns and hear the choral, the choir anthem than, than anything else. Yes, exactly. I get it. I totally get it. Well, Bob, I cannot thank you enough for spending a few moments of your evening with us. Uh, we're so appreciative. I'm so grateful for the opportunity, and I wish you all the very, very best, and we'll be back to worshiping in person before we know it, I hope. All together. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank everybody. You. Be well. Uh, Best of luck. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Wear your mask. And hum and sing in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, guys. Bye bye. Have a wonderful day.